Hi, welcome to Just Another Army Vet 2.0, where the channel is all about Indian content. I have another channel called Just Another Army Vet that's all about military and defense. I will link that channel in the description box below. For those of you who are curious, my background is that I'm a former combat medic for the U.S. Army. Today's video comes from the channel of Virat Hussein, who put out the documentary video series on the cargo war called The 50 Day War. Today is episode one. Let's get to it. Kargil, 1999, the time and place where the Indian Army shed their blood so that we could live with our head held high. A soldier at 19, an officer at 21, a martyr at 22. He died at the age of innocence in the season of spring when flowers bloom and love blossoms when the freshness of youth gives life and energy and vitality that only adolescents can have. He was an ordinary boy, born of ordinary parents in an ordinary village, an average student fond of movies who grew up playing games in Mohalla playgrounds. He prayed with his family on festive occasions. He loved his parents. He had many friends. He was an ordinary boy, and yet he died an extraordinary death. A death of valor, a death of bravery, a fearless, gallant, heroic death. He died for his country, he died for his people, he died for you and me. His story is what legends are made of. The 20th of February, 1999. The Prime Minister of India embarked on a momentous voyage, a journey which would be long remembered as a defining moment in the history of the subcontinent. As this busload of goodwill raced down the Atari Vaga road towards the border, the distance between the two countries seemed to shrink. Atal Bihari Vajpayee carried the popular mandate of a peace-loving nation. अपने समस्त देशवासियों की दुआएं और शुभकामनाएं मेरे साथ हैं, जो मुझे आज सीमा पार करके समय तथा अपनी पूरी यात्रा के दौरान प्रेरित करती रहेंगे। On the other side. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif waited with his entire cabinet to welcome his neighbor. Even as the two prime ministers inspected the Pakistan military guard of honor, few people noticed the absence of the Pakistan chief of army staff, General Parvez Musharraf, who had stayed away, citing his preoccupation with a minor foreign delegation. But there was no doubt that Sharif's welcome was warm as he quoted the poetry of Bajpai to make a point for peace. Was Nawaz Sharif aware that his army had already initiated a massive infiltration exercise on the borders of India or not is a question only history or Sharif can answer. So, it has been 20 plus years since this war has begun. 
So what does history tell us now? Was the Pakistani prime minister in on what the generals were doing or was he completely oblivious and just trying to make peace with India? Please drop your thoughts in the comments. The end of April 1999. While Bajpai now heads the caretaker government in Delhi, the areas of Kargil are peaceful. Though at the receiving end of unprovoked and severe shelling in April and May 1998, during the holy month of Muharram, the predominantly Muslim population of Dras and Kargil are ready to receive six months of welcome summer. It is during this period that they trade, raise their crops and graze their sheep to meet the rigors of six months of cruel winter, during which the Zojila Pass is closed, snapping all road links to the rest of the country. Darchit. Perhaps the only Aryan village in the world celebrates the scents and smells of summer. The peace of this region is suddenly shattered on the 30th of April. The Indian army has its first inkling of trouble. Indian air surveillance spots a Pakistan military helicopter carrying an underslung load. To military intelligence, this meant the chopper was not on a routine surveillance flight. A chopper with a large underbelly Surprise. could only mean it was carrying substantial quantities of steel. Or worse, it could be carrying a large dismantled gun. Even as the army was absorbing this information, three shepherds were grazing their flocks on the slopes of a hill in the Banjo area and the Baitalik sector. They noticed a group of men dressed in black scurrying off behind some rocks. Knowing the faces to be unfamiliar, they attempted to follow, but were dissuaded by a burst of small arm fire. One of the shepherds raced down to report the incident to the bridge guard at the Garkund village. The guard immediately took him to Lieutenant Colonel Anil Pandey, who was the officiating commanding officer of the three Punjab station there. Early the next morning, Lieutenant Colonel Pandey sent out a patrol led by Captain Gore, with one junior commissioned officer and 10 Javans, including two civil intelligence men of the 16 Grenadiers. The next day, on the 5th of May, Nayab Subedar Sulakhan Singh led another patrol which reconfirmed the sightings. I returned from my leave uh, from Leh on 3rd of May and when I returned here and I came to know that one of the patrols from my unit led by a JCO named uh, Nayab Subdar Sulakhan Singh he had gone out uh, just to confirm the presence of some un unidentified people in the general area uh, this Banjo which is behind this and then again further behind this far away from here when this patrol reported to me on 5th that there is some movement they have seen on the higher ridges of Kokarthang, which is cannot be seen from here. It's so again further, if this height you take this, double the height of this. So then I, the patrol went out of communication. So I just said, ki, okay, if it has gone out of the communication and since the movement has been spotted, then I as an officer will have to be going and then she also sent me there. Then we started climbing up. Then I chose my own route and we kept going up. We came under the mortar fire, that is indirect fire, and the artillery fire of the enemy. As we climbed up on the ridge line, that is leading to Kokarthang top. From there then I could see a lot of movement, like some on the ridge line of the Kokarthang, some people were moving in the black dresses and uh, some unidentified people, definitely not civilians. And then on to the Khalubar side, then on to Munthudalo, I saw a lot of movement. And then I kept passing with so and so strength I have seen. Plus we are coming under fire. Alarm now started spreading to the other units in Dras and Baitalik. On the 7th of May, Colonel Oberoi of the 16 Grenadiers sent out a patrol led by Major Surve, which was ambushed. Another patrol led by Major Rohit Gaur of the 10 Garwal Rifles was also ambushed near the Jubar Ridge. As reinforcements were rushed in, the brigade commanders realized that these were not isolated intrusions. By now, Enemy presence had been detected in Mashko and Kaksa, as well as Dras and Baitali. So it seems like things are starting to heat up according to the video. So my question is, at the time, was the Western media or the Indian media even covering any of this? 
Co Commander Lieutenant General Kishan Pal, the senior army commander in charge of the entire Kashmir area, rushed back to Sirinagar from the bedside of his ailing wife in Pune to take personal charge of the operations. His first action was to move to Kargil to collate all available intelligence reports and plan a cohesive response. The initial strategy was to get in contact with the enemy and uh, contain him as also carry out an accurate assessment of the extent and magnitude of this intrusion. By about uh, 16th, 17th, the picture had started emerging. Prior to that, the way it unfolded, starting from 3rd May to 17th of May, it is not possible to assess as to what the magnitude would be. Uh, it is only once our troops gained contact and started reporting uh, uh, the presence of the enemy at various features, uh, starting from Turtuk subsector, going all the way to Mashko, combined with the helicopter surveillance, that a larger picture emerged. By 17th, it was quite clear that it was a massive operation which undoubtedly was supported by Pakistan Army. Because of its artillery support, it became clear uh, that it was an operation of a large magnitude, great extent, and uh, full support, which would not be possible uh, to be planned, executed, and sustained by the so-called Mujahideen. Uh, its very nature revealed that it is a Pakistani army operation. Kishan Pal's boss, the GOC in chief, Northern Command, Lieutenant General Khanna, soon followed him, flying in from Udampur to monitor the situation. General Khanna decided to fly over the areas where intrusions had been reported. He got personal confirmation of enemy presence as his chopper was shot at by the intruders. Even as he returned safely to Sirinagar, the Indian Army ammunition dump in Kargil was blown up in cross-border shelling by Pakistan. The mood in Sirinagar was grim. Kishanpal realized that any effective response would require a massive troop movement through the Zojila Pass. Normally, Zojila Pass uh, is opened by about 15th of June. But uh, this year, because of the operational situation, uh, there was a necessity to open it early. And we pressed into service extra effort to make sure uh, that this would not be a hindrance. And uh, this, as we learned later on, came as a big shock to Pakistanis because uh, they had not anticipated uh, that Zojila could be opened uh, this early. As the Zojila Pass opened, the Corps Commander started a massive build-up of troops. With new information coming in every few hours, the situation certainly looked very serious. Channels of communication were set up, intrusions were mapped out, with the army taking no chances as it moved to a war footing. Even as the 111 Gorkha and the 5 Para Commando were readying themselves for combat, Pakistan started a systematic bombing of the Sirinagar Leh Highway and adjacent towns and villages. Panic-stricken citizens started streaming out of their homes and abandoning their villages. As the houses of the district magistrate and the superintendent of police in Kargil were damaged in heavy shelling. The Kargil TV tower was blown up causing further demoralization. The defense minister arrived for a visit of the forward areas, but was advised against going to Kargil. I understand bombing TV towers or army ammunition sites or anything like that, but why do people have to bomb schools and hospitals and villages? I just hate it when innocent civilians just get in the middle of these things. It the situation was fast deteriorating as General Kishanpal moved the 8th Sikh into Dras to surround the base of Tiger Hill. I wish someone could explain to me why their shoes are white or tan and their uniforms are like green or brown. I don't understand that 
contrast. It kind of makes them stand out. If someone wants to explain this uniform to me, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Little did the brave Khalsa realize that they would remain at the base of Tiger Hill for the next 50 days before they would be able to conquer its heights. With just about two days of acclimatization and hardly any special clothing, my battalion was launched on uh, 15th May to clear Tiger Hill 0 0.4460 and 0 0.4195. 0 0.4460 and 0 0.4195 were cleared by 17th morning. However, on 18th morning, when at, an, an attempt was made to clear Tiger Hill from southern slopes, where you see two small patches of snow, uh, the company came under very heavy fire. Another company that is uh, under Major Rathor was applied in area Pariyon Ka Talab. This is the Pariyon Ka Talab. As legend has it, banshees wail and dance on the frozen Talab on moonlit nights. Brave young Lieutenant Kannad Bhattacharya went missing in this area on the 17th of May while attempting an assault on the hill from the northwestern direction. He was not to return alive. His body would be only discovered after the snow had melted and the Indian tricolor had reappeared atop of Tiger Hill. The village of Kaksa, surrounded by overpowering mountains. It was in these peaks and valleys on the 14th of May the desperate messages of the 4th Battalion of the Jat Regiment echoed, searching for a lost patrol. Oh, hope it's not the one that got Earlier that day, Lieutenant Saurav Kalia had been sent out with an ill-fated six-member team to occupy Bajrang Post. Oh no. The narrow valley which we see in front of us is the route which uh, Saurav Kalia took to the glacier areas on his way to Bajrang post. Once the initial intrusions were detected in other areas, on the 14th of May, Lieutenant Saurav Kalia was tasked to lead a patrol. The patrol started in the morning and uh, well after midday, we lost radio contact with the patrol. Uh, when Saurav went missing and efforts to get in touch with him failed, then uh, Lieutenant Amit Bhardwaj was tasked to take out a patrol and locate Saurav's missing patrol. Amit was immediate senior of Saurav and as in the traditions in uh, battalions, he was the one who was tasked to educate the youngster on the norms of the army life and on the traditions of the battalion. That terrain, oh Bhardwaj my gosh. Patrol, it was a very strong patrol which had 30 strong bodies with it. And they, they, the basic task was to contact uh, the patrol Saurabh, which was the first patrol that had gone. And uh, this is the one which was to sort of retrieve it. But then it could not reach anywhere near to where Saurabh Kalia had taken his surveillance patrol. This is basically because then the Pakistanis, they, the enemy did know that now naturally since uh, uh, these people have been let's say fired upon or they have been captured or whatever it was, uh, they sort of were ready for you. So a very heavy volume of fire from the direct and indirect firing weapons came onto this patrol which was known as patrol Birdie. Uh, this came under fire and they couldn't reach anywhere. The officer, Bhardwaj was injured. He sustained two bullet injuries. He, along with one Havaldar, Rajbir, they both, you know, they took up position. Though injured, the first one, that is Bhardwaj, took up position, kept on firing at the enemy and told all the, ordered the patrol, you see, to extricate from there. And uh, these two, 
they kept on giving the covering fire. It was 62 days later when the territory was recaptured that the two mummified bodies were recovered close to Bajrang Post. Lieutenant Amit Bharadwaj was still holding his weapon in his hand, his finger pressing an empty trigger. The oh, fate wow. of Lieutenant Saurav Kalia and his men, however, came to light only on the 9th of June. Major Rahul Jain at post 42 was to receive the bodies of Lieutenant Saurav Kalia and his team. Well, this is where we live. And for a big guy like me, it becomes something like this. This place. There's no movement in the day for a simple reason. Both sides is waiting to take a pot shot. And uh, there's absolutely no movement in the day. We generally move at night. Being very close to the LC, my closest post starts at what, 20 meters. It is, and with the latest situation prevailing, both sides is waiting to take a shot at the other. So, Night is the best time to do all your jobs. They usually stick inside because we got snipers on both sides. And one shot is good enough to take a guy. Rest uh, living in this bunker because this bunker has got about uh, five and a half feet overhead, primarily to prevent any damage from RT fire or any of the heavy, heavier weapons. And. Uh, over the time, one has got used to it. We were told that uh, they are handing over six bodies, that is, one left in Kalia and five others, though they couldn't give us the names right, but we had a hunch it is them. I had gone to receive the bodies. When we got the bodies, we first tried to identify them. The first two bodies, we could still make out what the face looked like. The bodies had burnt marks, the eyes had been gouged out. In my hearts of hearts, a soldier doesn't do all this. At least a soldier cannot do all this if he's a soldier from the heart. The Saurav Kalia's body had been shot through the face. And actually the only way I could identify that body was because it had a gold chain around its neck. That it happens to be an officer. In fact, the people who came to identify also were not very sure. So, I really can't put it into words how I felt during that time. Probably had the situation not been tense, I would have cut his throat. I can't imagine how traumatizing that must have been for that soldier and his team to receive those bodies of those murdered soldiers. I cannot even imagine how horrible that would have been but I think it was so horrible, the torture that was inflicted on these poor soldiers that I believe this made the news. I remember seeing that on the movie Sher Shah. I think this even got some international attention because of how horrific the torture was. I don't think they ever got justice though. If I'm wrong, please drop that in the comments. An avid student of birds Saurav Kalia's memory lingers on in the minds of his battalion of the Forge Art every time they look up at the sky to see a flock of birds flying away. In the next few days, the Prime Minister, the Home Defence and Foreign Ministers were briefed by the Military Operations Directorate as the countdown to a formal conflict between India and Pakistan seemed inevitable. Indian Chief of Army Staff General Ved Parkash Malik toured the Dras Kargil Bethalik sectors on the 23rd of May. The next day, he invited the Air Force Chief, Air Chief Marshal A.V. Tipness, to join him at the Military Operations Directorate at the Army Headquarters in Delhi. The Indian Air Force now placed two fighter squadrons on high alert for possible strike operations along the line of control.
The next day, the two chiefs briefed the cabinet committee on security. Later that day, Air Chief Marshal Tipnus traveled incognito to forward areas to prime the Indian Air Force strike base. On the 26th of May, the Prime Minister launched Operation Vijay. As dawn broke, MiG-23s, MiG-27s and Mi-17 helicopter gunships took off from airfields in Avantipur in Sirinagar. Flying 30 missions on the same day, Operation Safed Sagar, as the air operations were called, founded the base camps of the enemy in Indian territory, marking the start of a bloody 50-day war which would end with heavy casualties on both sides. A war which would make Kargil a household name in India. A war where the bravery of the Indian soldier would be etched in blood on those icy slopes for time immemorial. So this is a very well-researched video series. I'm definitely enjoying it and learning some. I know almost nothing about the cargo war except what I learned when I reacted to the movie Shersha, plus when I interacted with viewers in the comments section. I'll put that reaction video on the screen for you guys. But I think it would be a good idea for me to finish this series just because I do want to learn more. If you guys do want me to finish this reaction series, then drop your thoughts in the comments. If I decide to do episode 2, I'll put it right here. Until then, you'll find another good video. Also, since people have asked, there are some really easy ways to support the channel. You can like my videos, share, subscribe, comment, watch some of my other videos, or you can check out some links in my description box below or hit the thanks button. Anything you guys do is appreciated, so thank you.